Hey everybody, welcome to a place probably a lot of you have not been uh, before. We're right near the tunnel of Tunnel Hill and we're at the Clisby Austin House. This was a headquarters for one, two, maybe three different uh, officers during the Civil War, possibly even on both sides. This was a hospital after the Battle of Chickamauga. There's other things going on in and around this house and Whitfield County does a great job interpreting the house and of course Tunnel Hill on which we'll have a separate, uh, separate video. And maybe at the end of this one, we'll show you something most of you probably haven't seen not far from this house as well. So to take us through this house and talk all about this, here's Dave Powell. God, I don't even know how to introduce him. Author of 1,600 books and a bunch of things on Chickamauga. Dave, take it away. Good afternoon. We're here on a beautiful Sunday afternoon in Whitfield County. Uh, we are, as noted, at the Clisby Austin House, the Reverend Clisby Austin, uh, an English uh, Methodist minister, comes here before the Civil War. Uh, this is a, a well-established fine brick home uh, and as such it becomes a magnet for the armies when they finally get down here and start passing through. Um, it, is, uh, it has seen uh, Confederate activity in 1863 uh, uh, right at the end of the Chickamauga campaign or I'm sorry the Chattanooga campaign uh, uh, but really the focal point of, of this house uh, centers around two things. Uh, the first is the wounding uh, and recuperation of Major General John Bell Hood, and we'll talk about that a little more as we get into the house. Uh, the second thing is uh, that for uh, approximately five days, uh, from May 7th uh, until May 12th, uh, it is the the the, the the nerve center, the, the command center for Sherman's combined armies of the Tennessee, of the Cumberland, and of the Ohio, Sherman's uh, uh, department or uh, division of the Mississippi headquarters is right here in, in and around the Clisby Austin house. So why don't we go inside and take a look around? Cool. We'll follow you on in, Dave, while I pan around. Beautiful countryside. Today the house is set up as a, as a museum and interpretation center. Uh, this room obviously is devoted to uh, General Sherman's headquarters. Uh, uh, you can see the table, uh, the field desk with Sherman sitting here plotting with his maps. Uh, uh, the, the very lifelike General Sherman. Uh, staff officer uh, around here in the corner. but. Uh, it's, it's furnished largely with period pieces, from what I understand. And in order to interpret the medical side of our story, we'll come in here where a surgeon is addressing the wounded. Uh, this, uh, this, this house be first becomes a field hospital uh, after the Battle of Chickamauga in September 1863. It's situated right next to the Western and Atlantic Railroad tracks so that uh, soldiers can recuperate here until they're well enough to be moved south, further south to places like uh, Kennesaw, Marietta, uh, uh, and Atlanta itself where there are uh, uh, more substantial, more permanent hospitals. Uh, immediately after Chickamauga, uh, the, uh, the South began to mobilize their resources for this huge influx of wounded. 800, or 18,454 Confederates fell, killed, wounded, or, or captured at Chattanooga. So there were something on the order of 12 or 13,000 Confederate wounded that needed to be treated. And then on top of that, there are 16,351 Federal killed, wounded, and captured. And and at least three or 4,000 of those Federals also fall into Confederate hands. And so this, this massive, uh, uh, really disaster, this, this natural, or not natural disaster, man-made disaster of all these people who, who desperately needed care creates this chain of hospitals that goes all the way back to Atlanta. Why don't we go upstairs and visit arguably the most famous of those patients that needs treatment. This 
This room is set up to interpret the recovery of General John Bell Hood. On September 20th, 1863, Hood's right leg was, uh, was injured. He, he, a musket ball struck his right leg, uh, transversed the upper thigh, shattered the thigh bones, and necessitated an amputation very high up on, uh, on uh, almost within just a couple of inches of the hip. That's a very risky operation. Uh, only, uh, only about a 7% survival rate uh, uh, from, from treatment of, of that amputation. As a result, most people thought that Hood was going to die. As a matter of fact, the very early reports that come out of the, the Battle of Chickamauga, the first reports that appear in Confederate newspapers, all say that Hood was either killed or mortally wounded at the Battle of Chickamauga. But Hood recovers. He shows amazing resilience. Uh, he is, his, his leg is taken off in a field hospital uh, out somewhere near Ringgold, uh, where the First Corps hospitals are set up. And then he is moved down into uh, Armucci Valley, about 20 miles south of here, where he stays at the Colonel Little house. Colonel Little was a colonel in one of his Georgia regiments in Hood's division. He had been wounded at Chancellorsville and was already there recuperating. And so uh, Hood's uh, surgeon, uh, Chief Surgeon uh, John Darby uh, agrees to move uh, Hood down with Colonel Little and they recuperate there. And Hood will spend several days, almost a month, I believe, down uh, in Armucci Valley recuperating. And then when he's ready to return to Richmond, he will be brought back north uh, out of Armucci Valley here to the railroad, where he can then be safely transported first to Atlanta and ultimately to Richmond, where he will spend the winter of 1863, 1864, rec recuperating in Richmond and uh, spending a great deal of time with President Jefferson Davis. Good, and you know, as any good uh, old historic house, you, you've got to see, you've got some sinks, you've got your mirror to clean up, and of course, everybody's favorite feature, the potter chair. So why don't we go back downstairs and we'll talk a little bit about the use of the house for a military headquarters. So Sherman's uh, Department of the Mississippi headquarters is actually fairly small. The main logistical and administrative work of the Atlanta campaign is being conducted primarily by Thomas's, George H. Thomas's much larger uh, Department of the Cumberland headquarters. And they have a field headquarters here and further they have uh, both uh, Thomas and Sherman have uh, administrative headquarters in Chattanooga and then further up at Nashville. Sherman's main departmental headquarters is actually in Nashville for almost the entire Atlanta campaign, but Sherman, of course, is here in the field. The work here of Sherman and, and his staff officers, uh, uh, this is the nerve center of the orchestration of nearly 100,000 men uh, in three separate armies, uh, the Army of Tennessee that numbers about uh, 25,000 men and the Army of the, uh, of the Cumberland, which numbers about 60,000 men. Uh, and finally, the uh, Army of the Ohio under John M. Schofield, which numbers about 15,000 men. And this vast amount of troops and wagons is all being moved towards, initially towards Dalton. Later, it will be moved down towards Resaca, Georgia, as Sherman decide, confronts the defenses at Dalton, the very formidable Confederate defenses at Dalton and then move south, uh, deciding to outflank those via the, the very famous maneuver of sending James B. McPherson and the Army of the Tennessee through Snake Creek Gap. But for about five days, this is Sherman's headquarters. He, he spends the nights here, he gets up every day, rides to the front, which is only a few miles away, uh, confers with, uh, with Thomas and Schofield and some of the Corps commanders and then rides back. 
this is a uh, this is where his telegraph has established communications back to Ringgold and ultimately all the way back to Washington D.C. So he can remain in constant communication, uh, and and so this is where Sherman is going to spend a lot of time for the week of uh, May five or, or May seven through twelve. Very cool. We outside. We outside. All right. Let's take it out here. You can see this is, as I said on the way in, just beautiful around here. And we're not going to walk all the way out, but what we're going to do is cut the video here. Um, and then we are going to walk out to where uh, you can see the train car in the distance. And then we're going to turn left along that road and we'll pick up in a moment. So here we are back out on the road. And if we were to walk just to the end right there and turn right, you'd be staring right at the tunnel into Tunnel Hill, which you can maybe see above the trees over there. But the reason we wanted to come out here was to show you a marker that most people don't come to see. It hasn't been here all that long, 15 years or so. And Dave, uh, you know, give us an idea of what we're looking at here. I guess you can read what it says on there, y'all. But Dave, let's talk to us about that. Well, um, when Hood, when Hood's leg was amputated, out closer to Ringgold in one of the field hospitals, uh, because of Victorian burial, burial customs and, and uh, the image of, of, of a good death, the Victorian wanted to be buried intact, all of his parts together. And so uh, they took Hood's leg off, but then they kept it with him, uh, certainly in the move down to Armucci Valley, down to Colonel Little's house primarily because they expected him to die. And they wanted all of his, all of John Bell Hood to be buried together. Now, um, subsequently, when he recovered, and, and uh, he, uh, he, he, a number of interesting things happened when he was down there at Colonel Little's house. You've, there's a, a great deal of mythology associated with Hood and with uh, the leg and with uh, Hood's infamous opium addiction, which you may have heard of. Interestingly enough, we have Surgeon Darby's journal, which uh, tells us that Hood weaned himself off of opiates very quickly down there in Amurchi Valley and, and was relatively pain-free and did not rely on opiates on a regular basis. Um, but the leg uh, traveled with him at least probably to Amurchi Valley. And uh, from there, the story gets a little murkier. When Hood uh, recovered and was and came north, one story has it that the leg came here with him, and uh, was going to uh, it was brought with him as far as here where it was buried, somewhere in the Clisby Austin uh, on the Clisby Austin farm. This modern marker, uh, there's absolutely no way to be certain that this marks a spot where Hood's leg is buried. Um, uh, a, uh, another version of the story actually has um, Hood's uh, leg entrusted to a staff member to take back to Texas, where Hood expected to be buried. And so uh, that staff member came here, uh, and this was as far as he was able to carry the leg before burying it. Initially, at least the thought is, temporarily, uh, uh, before uh, so that uh, in time it could be dug up and reinterred with the rest of General Hood, assuming that he passed. So the bottom line is we really have no idea where Hood's leg is, at least from a historical perspective. But there are uh, several conflicting stories about how it might have got here to the Clisby Austin farm and how it's quite possibly buried on the property here. Good, good. You ready to take this thing back from me? Certainly. All right. Sorry, I need to grab a cough drop during filming if you heard my crinkling around. So <laughs> what I would say is, uh, you know, I don't think we talked about a single battle in particular on that whole video. What did we talk about? We talked about headquarters. We talked about hospitals. This is where the Civil War really played out is on people's houses and farms and whatnot. Men, women, and children living their lives, having war disrupt those lives, and having the military machine come in and plan the next move. So we know you'll tell us if you like this sort of stuff or if you like just the blood and guts battle stuff a little bit more. But either way, we thank you for watching and thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation. And we'll leave with one last view of the hood leg marker. There you go.